Uh, we are taking a break from Romans this morning, so you get to keep praying about submission to the government and things like that, and next week we will begin to, to make some more application on that. But uh, we have a special guest speaker this morning, and I just wanted to call up him and his wife here just to pray for them first. So this is Pat and Jolene Brady. And Pat and Jolene are the ones who, who wrote the call to mission that we studied in Sunday school. And so I know a lot of us uh, benefited and ate the fruit of, of the, the way to be intentional in our evangelism, depending on the spirit. And so I just wanted everybody to get to meet this sweet couple. Um, every time I'm used to a, a mic, so I want to keep <laughs> stepping away. Um, so, so Pat is going to come share the word with us this morning, but I, I did not want you to get away without meeting his bride. They are the picture of team ministry, and they just love ministering together as a couple and uh, saying, I didn't know how, how deep marriage could go, and they're just, um, it's been a blessing to watch. And then they have been discipling and mentoring me and Laura over the last year and several other couples in this church going through something called CTM, a call, or CTO, a call to obedience. And so just wanted you all, if you get a chance to come meet them uh, and talk with them afterwards. But uh, if you see me growing at all, it, God's using them. And, and if you don't see me growing, it's their fault. So. <laughs> So hallelujah. So Jolene, I just wanted to pray and thank the Lord for you as a couple. Father, I'm so grateful for this sweet couple and just even the, the love and the impact they've had in this body, the way they've prayed and encouraged on many. God, we're just so grateful. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. What a family reunion this morning to gather with them and to worship you and to open the word of God. So Thank you for bringing them here this morning. We are grateful and just ask that you keep using them in mighty ways for the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And it's in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen. 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 And then I'm going to share a few more things about your husband. So you just kind of stay up here so you don't, I don't want to wear you out. Um, so Pat um, Braddy. He is a, a pastor, and I wrote down the name of his church. church It'd probably be quicker that way. Redemption Church of Greeley. And so uh, when Pat was 77, he did what most people usually do. Uh, he planted a church. Um, and so you just can't slow these two down. And so they've planted this church in Greeley. God is doing mighty things. And so I just wanted him to come and share the word of God with us. And um, really, we're going to be in John 4 this morning. Um, there's a lot I could share about him, but I, I think he was a veterinarian. But I, what, the reason I asked him to come this morning is he knows Christ. He walks with him and he just wants him to be made known. And I think that's why you should open up and listen this morning because he will bring you the word of God from a heart that it has been dwelling in. So brother, come bring the word of God. Can you all hear me okay? Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah, we're good. Well, thank you for the privilege to come down and, and open God's Word with you this morning. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to invest in your lives and your ministry through Call to Mission as well as the Call to uh, Obedience discipling tool that we use and have used for many years. So. It's great to be here. I'm part of a church planting team, so I've got a couple young guys that I just try to stay up with. And that's a job some days, but uh, so far, so, so good. Uh, so anyway, with that, uh, I just want to open this passage to you today. It's not about the Samaritan woman so much as it's about what happened after she came to faith. So if you have your Bibles or your cell phones, whatever it is you use to turn to God's Word, I'd encourage you to turn with me to chapter 4 in John's Gospel, beginning in verse 27. Let me introduce uh, this passage maybe this way. Uh, when I was really first taught to effectively use the bridge illustration, uh, I was taught to use it 
but I also had to memorize 20 verses to make it make sense. And consequently, because I couldn't remember 20 verses very well, I didn't, pre, or I, I didn't share my faith much with the bridge illustration. And, and the sad news is I was a pastor. So take that for whatever you will. But it, it just it showed me and, and shows, I think, all of us the challenges we have at times in sharing our faith. And I feel a little bit like, and I, I hope you haven't heard the story about the lady who went through the evangelism explosion training, and she was asked to uh, go out and share her faith with a lady who had visited her church. And so she went out, and then she came back, and the, the outreach m- minister was there, and, and he said, well, how did it go? And she said, it went okay. And he said, well, did you pray before you uh, knocked on her door? And she said, yes, I did pray. And he said, well, tell me more. And she said, well, I prayed that the woman would not be home, and God answered my prayer. <laughs> I know we so often feel like that. You know, we, we, we get nervous, we get sweaty hands, and we feel inadequate and ill-prepared. And, and so today I want to share with you a passage that I hope will build your faith, not so much in you, but in the work of the Spirit of God in you and through you when we have opportunities to proclaim the gospel. Uh, I'm sure some of you have felt just like I do, but we we get in this uh, passage today the opportunity after Jesus ministers to the Samaritan woman to see how he taught his disciples following that encounter Uh, with him and her coming to faith. And I think it's exciting. And I think it will help us to be stronger, and more prepared and equipped to go out and to share our faith as opportunities arise. I think personally, for me, this is one of the most powerful passages in all of the scripture about this thing called doing evangelism. What I want to do with you is, is to help you understand the role and nature of the Holy Spirit working in and through us. So the outline really comes down to three things. The first point we're going to talk about is spiritual or supernatural encounters. The second thing is supernatural motivation. And then lastly, and most importantly, is supernatural power. So that's kind of the roadmap for where we're headed Let me, before we go down that path, explain to you what I mean by the word supernatural. I'm talking about this totally in the context of the working of the Spirit of God alone. There's a lot of spiritual stuff out there from the kingdom of darkness, but we're talking about the work here of the living God through His Holy Spirit and how He cooperates and works alongside using us in this thing called sharing and proclaiming the gospel. So that's how we're using it, the Holy Spirit moving on the hearts, minds, and lives of people who want to be faithful to share about this uh, glorious thing we've prayed about, Jesus come into our world to bear the penalty for our sins, to die in our place, and then sends us out to do the same for the sake of others who are lost. So join me as I read a a few of the first verses Uh, beginning in verse 27, we're going to read down through 30. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left, this is the Samaritan woman, the woman left her water jug and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. So what I want us to do, and you're going to get real tired of me saying the word supernatural today, but we're going to look at how the Spirit was operating in this engagement between Jesus and the woman and then what he taught the disciples as a result of that. So first it says, the disciples come back. If you remember a little bit of the account, Jesus said he had to go to Samaria. That's how chapter 4 begins. What we see in Jesus and the way this passage will conclude is a profound truth that is so sweet and so precious. But 
uh, we'll hang on to that for a few moments. What, what's transpiring here is he is dismissing this woman. We believe she's come to faith because of what she does. And so the Holy Spirit is even leading his disciples to stay away until Jesus was done sharing with this woman and releasing her to go back to her village. So even at that point, the Holy Spirit was working and moving in this spiritual encounter with this woman, and we'll see many more things in that. Uh, in this engagement of Jesus with her, she came to faith. I believe that with all my heart. Even though she was a Samaritan woman, and remember, back in that day, uh, uh, Israeli or, or Israelite men would not talk with Samaritans, and they certainly would be not speaking, at least a godly one would not be speaking with a woman by herself. And, and so the disciples are a little bit surprised by that. But they don't say anything to Jesus because they know Jesus is Jesus, and he is God incarnate. And so in all of this, we see this amazing supernatural encounter unfold as this woman hears the gospel from Jesus, believes. And in her excitement, what does she do? She goes back to her hometown to share what's happened in her life. And she's so excited that she leaves her water jug on the ground. And she just moves out to go share what's happened in her life. And so it says, so the woman, verse 28, left her water jar and went into her town. So she headed off to Sychar, to the people who had despised her, who had rejected her, who literally had hated her. She went out to get water by herself. And so it was in that situation that this woman went back in a totally unique and different way to speak to these people who had not treated her well, she's taking to them what? By the supernatural power of God, the gospel. And so she goes and she engages with them in this profound way as the Spirit leads and moves in her life. Don't you just love that? This broken woman who was despised is going back to these people who had literally uh, despised her and spoken ill of her and treated her badly, so badly that she went to draw water by herself. She goes back because of the working of the Spirit of God in her life. And so we see that unfold in this passage as we move forward. She goes back, and so as Jesus had had a supernatural encounter with her, she goes back and has what? With the town people a spiritual encounter with them. I believe she's being led and empowered by the Spirit of God to go back to these people and to share with them this amazing, incredible thing that's happened in her life. She met a man who told her everything, the text says, that she ever did. She is bearing her testimony that she has come to understand and believe in Jesus. And we'll see more of that as it unfolds. So in the midst of this, She's proclaiming to these town po folks that this man spoke to her out of the deepest and most painful part of her life, her need for love, her need for acceptance. And through that engagement with Jesus, that supernatural encounter with him, she came to believe and to have faith in him. And then what happens is that this ministry continues on as the Spirit directs and guides her. And she goes out to ask this question, and I believe, again, the Spirit is working in her as he helped her uh, formulate the question that she spoke to these people. Can this be the Christ? She, shouldn't, she, she couldn't have said much more because they despised her so much. She couldn't speak boldly or rebuke them or do anything like that. She just simply had to go and raise a question that would perhaps draw their attention to spiritual things. And we see that it did. We see the supernatural working of the Spirit now, not just in her life, but now in the life of all of these uh, folks uh, from Sychar. And it says in verse 30, they went out of the town and were coming to him. Again, a supernatural response. The Spirit is working in their hearts and lives and, and taking this amazing thing that happened with this woman and 
encouraging others who were spiritually open to go out and to see for themselves this Jesus. What happened is totally the work of the Spirit in the lives of these people as this event unfolds. I think it's amazing as we just pause for a moment and, and, th- a moment and think about what all is going on here. This woman, an unbeliever, but knew something of spiritual things. She argued with Jesus a little bit in the encounter. She uh, is convinced by him, comes to faith in him. We believe she believed and was instantly regenerated because of Jesus' ministry into her life. And immediately she goes out and she begins to talk with others about this Jesus. It's amazing to me, just think for a moment of, of this woman, how the Spirit must have led her to walk into a town that literally despised her, maybe even hated her, didn't want her around, uh, shoot her away whenever she showed up around them. The work of the Spirit in transforming her and empowering her to go is amazing from my perspective. She goes out zealously to share with these people who had disliked her and, and, and despised her. And God uses her to bring the initial testimony and an initial conviction that Jesus is unique. And so they go out because of the spiritual work in uh, this woman's life to check out Jesus for themselves. So let's move on and see what transpires next. Meanwhile, it says in verse 31, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone bought, brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. We see now Jesus taking this opportunity to teach his disciples more deeply about this work of reaching out to people supernaturally. And and I call this, in, in this event, we see Jesus lay out for us the supernatural motivation for outreach, for evangelism, for reaching people who desperately need him. It begins with this uh, little uh, encounter of Jesus uh, speaking with the disciples, them urging him to eat something. Remember, he was hungry. Uh, He stopped at the well. They went into town to get food. He didn't go with them because he was tired. And so they bring him food to eat. And he says to them in response to this, I have food to eat that you do not know about. What I, what I find interesting about the, uh, the d- disciples at this point, they're so much like me. The primary thing on their mind was, Jesus, what's for lunch? Let's eat. You know, that's just kind of the guy thing. And, and we see that unfolding here. That they're like I am so often, and, and many of us are. We think more on, on a... Uh, a plane of this physical world rather than the spiritual reality that is out there all around us. And what Jesus is saying to them is, I'm operating in a different realm that you, than you think about often. I'm working with this woman uh, to bring spiritual truth to her. He said, my food is to do that which you don't even know about. And he goes on to say later, My food is to do the will of him, the will of him who sent me, and to accomplish his work. Think about those words for a moment with me. Jesus wanted his disciples to understand what they were observing in this woman's life and what they were going to see transpire as this event unfolds more and more and more. And he wants to move their thinking and give them a a supernatural motivation for their life. And and he says very plainly to it, this is what his supernatural motivation is. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. 
That is the heart of this passage. We sang about it this morning as we worship God. We have the most profound, significant message ever spoken in this world. And there's not one person on this planet that does not need that. And Jesus is encouraging his disciples into understanding what matters more than anything else in our lives is this simple truth that we're here to do the will of God and to be used by him to see people come to faith. Listen to these words again. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. Powerful. Ponder it. And what we will see come out of this is that the disciples are beginning to get it. Their role and their, their part in this mission is to, for them also to begin to do the will of God. To do these very things Jesus is said for them to accomplish his work, to do the will of him who sent me. So, so I want to talk with you just for a moment about what's going on here. Is, is Jesus is unfolding this incredible truth of supernatural motivation for our lives. We've seen already a little bit about supernatural encounters, but su supernatural motivation is what leads us to be ever mindful that there are spiritual needs in our world, as Jesus did and, and as the disciples came to understand more and more. And, and just think about this. As you go through life, one of the things that we try to encourage you and call to mission was be aware of people around you who may be spiritually open, through which you may walk forward supernaturally motivated to get to know them, to find out if there's interest, to perhaps even walk down a journey of, of describing or explaining to them the gospel, but then also maybe taking a journey with them through John's gospel or, or some other discipling tool to help them come to faith. That is to do the will of the Father, to help them come to that place. Living to please the Father. And what Jesus is saying to his disciples is, right now, my food is to do that. You're out there getting lunch and, and I'm here accomplishing the Father's will. And, 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 and I don't want us to think that it isn't important for us to take good cares of our bodies and eat well and do those kinds of things. But that isn't the end of life. I hope none of you here live to eat. That's not why we're here. We eat to live so that we can serve the living God and accomplish His will. You know, look at TV. I, I, I don't watch a lot of TV, but 75% of TV anymore seems like it's food shows. How to make this? What chef is doing that? Who's going to be the best cook in this school? And on and on and on it goes. It, it, I don't know, but, but understand, that's not the most important thing in life. It is to do the will of the Father and to use this time that we have in our lives to do those things. and uh, He explains this to his disciples in this way. His nourishment, his satisfaction was in seeing this woman respond to the gospel and then to go out and tell others about Jesus. That was his food. That's what brought joy and satisfaction to his heart. You know, Psalm 48, Psalm 40, verse 8 says, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. What a place to live, delighting in doing the will of God. And that's what Jesus would have us understand through this passage, I believe, uh, as we think about what motivates us in life. Is it supernaturally led and empowered by the Spirit of God so that we go out looking for these people that Jesus mentions who are out there who are spiritually open. He goes on, and I really want to elaborate on this verse, the next verse in verse, uh, he says, do not say there are yet four months. Do you not say there are yet four months? Then comes the harvest. Look, listen to this. I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields 
are ripe for harvest. Now we know that he's probably seeing these people walk out from Sychar toward him. And maybe in their white garments or whatever, they look like grain. I don't know. But the important truth is here is that there are spiritually hungry, lost people out there in our world. If you read further in John and you get to the 16th chapter and read verses 8 through 10, uh, we don't have time to get into all this, but this is when Jesus said, I'm going to go away and I'm going to send the Spirit to be with you. And he said, the Spirit of God is going to have a ministry, not just to you, but to the lost of this world. Hear me well. He is working in the world in Denver, Colorado, all around this church to convict people of their sin, of their need for righteousness and the coming judgment. Those people who are under conviction are spiritually open. And the question and the call on our lives is to just go and get acquainted with them. Wherever your sphere of influence takes you in life, at work, wherever you work out, wherever you go to school, whatever you do, there are, spiritual, there are people who are spiritually open, I believe. And the call of God on our lives is to press into them with boldness. My wife and I moved to be part of this church plant a year and a half ago, and we walk around our neighborhood. We've met 20 neighbors so far, and always... I'm the one that she wants to run from sometimes because I ask questions that she doesn't like me to ask when we just meet somebody. Like, tell me, do you have any spiritual interests? That's my favorite question. Guess what we've learned? About 10 of those 20 people we've met at least describe to us a genuine uh, experience with Christendom they go to church. We know some of the churches they go to. So we're assuming these are people that at least have heard the gospel. We don't know. We don't have time to press into them because there's 10 other families who know nothing. They, they just look at us. They still talk to us. Some of them just shut up and walk away. But some of them still talk to us, and they're open. And those are the families we're going to pursue more and more. We're working at that. We're taking a few meals in for some folks. We've had one family in our home, but we need to do more and more of that. But understand, all around your life, wherever you go, there are people that are spiritually open. And I want to encourage you with all my heart to press into them as we see here. Jesus says in this verse, Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Do you believe that there are still spiritually open people out there wherever you work, live, wherever your sphere of influence takes you. Jesus says three times in the New Testament these truths. He says in Matthew 9, 37 and Luke 10, 2, Behold, the fields are ripe for harvest. Send out workers into the harvest fields. I believe with all my heart that is still true. I believe people are still being convicted of their sin and people are still struggling with knowing they're sinful and struggling with doing life. And he calls us, I believe, to go and reach out to them through this supernatural motivation that he lays out for these. You know, I think it's amazing to think a little bit in this passage about what really transferred or trans came to pass in uh, Sychar. We know the disciples went there to get food. I'm thinking as they walked into the town, they said, this is a despicable place. They would never listen to our message. We want nothing to do with them. And so they bought food and went back to the well to meet Jesus. And guess what happens? This woman goes, this despised, forlorn, dejected, hated woman goes back to town full of the Holy Spirit and the whole village almost comes to Christ. You tell me there wasn't something going on there that the disciples missed? I'm going to tell you, I believe that. And I believe also around us in our lives, there are things going on that sometimes we miss. And I want to implore you, encourage you in every way I can. 
to press in with love and grace and truth into the lives of people that you know. To find out if there's spiritual openness and then take steps toward that. We've got to move on. Already, verse 36 says, or 38, I can't read it because my, my type's too small. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for his eternal life. So the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. I, I think this is such an incredible, beautiful passage. Think, think about this for a minute. What Jesus is saying in these words is that the people that sow and the people that reap are rejoicing together. They're, they're working at the same time. I don't know if you know much about farming, but I grew up in one of the richest agricultural counties in this world, Well County. And farmers have to plant a seed. If you have a garden, you plant your seeds, and you wait about four months for anything to come up that you could use. And hence this statement. But what Jesus is saying here, that is not true in the spiritual kingdom. Sowing and reaping were happening in this village at the same time. Isn't that amazing? That's the work of the Spirit of God. It is a fulfillment, I believe, of a prophecy from Amos 9, 13. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. Listen to that. The person who is plowing overcomes the harvester. That's the picture of what's happening in Sychar through the supernatural motivation and work that is occurring through this woman. And we will see unfold as we move forward. For here the saying holds true, verse 37 says, One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. What he's telling us here is uh, there's always generally somebody before you that's sown into this person's life, perhaps. Uh, of the people that we've seen God use us, to bring to believing faith over the last number of years, well over half of them have had some kind of spiritual background. They've either grown up in the Catholic Church and walked away, or they've grown up in another kind of church and walked away with never understanding the gospel, embracing the finished work of Christ. So there's spiritual confusion, I suppose, in their minds, but also a little bit of spiritual interest about uh, how they were raised. And so... So what he's saying to us here is we're building on things that have happened in people's lives before we ever met them. And I could give you specific examples if we had time, but, but the reality is God's working through many different people in the lives. Sorry. In the lives of uh, these people in Sychar, uh, you know, through Moses' teachings. They had some religious background. They had some misunderstandings, of course. Jesus came. Then this woman came. So there were people pouring into them. And the reality is, as Paul taught us, he planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the growth. So he uses many different situations in the lives of people to draw them to faith. Some we never have a hand in, but we may be in that process somewhere. What happens here? as we walk forward in this supernatural motivation, is we can be a part of that path and we can see people come to faith. And so we see happening in this community is this woman goes and we don't see all the events of it yet, but there's supernatural spiritual work going on in the hearts and lives of these people. Let's move on to verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did so when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed, listen to these words. This is too good not to fix, brother. I'm sorry. I'm going to scrunch your ear up. Just That's okay. Okay. How's that feel? That's better. If it, if it comes off, you're going to have to stand All up. All right, I'll okay. use that one. All right. 
But the reality is uh, we see what's happened in Sychar as a result of all this. We see first that many Samaritans believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Imagine that. This woman knew nothing but about her encounter with Jesus and many people come to faith. So trust more in the spirit in this work than in yourself. He is able to draw people to himself. Go in in prayer and, and in reliance and trusting and knowing that's what the spirit of God is here to do, to use you, to bring conviction through you as he did this woman. Many, it says, came to believe because of her testimony that Jesus told her everything that he ever did. Here, I want you to see for the first time in this passage is incredible spiritual power. We've talked about supernatural encounters, supernatural motivation, and now we're going to talk about supernatural power. Through this woman, this broken woman who comes back transformed by Jesus, many believe. The text goes on to say, so when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days and many more believed because of his word. We see that people came because of her testimony, but the work of the spirit drew many others to want Jesus to stay and to abide with him and to learn from him as he taught uh, the, the word of God to them, as he shared with them. And so it says, many more believed because of his word. And, and I want you to see the, the uh, movement from a testimony which is powerful and great and use yours. And this is why we help people learn to share your testimony. Because it's very powerful when you get acquainted with people to share with them what God has done in your life. We do this all the time. But the next stage is to get them to the word of God. So the word of God can bring conviction to them about who Jesus is and why they need Jesus because of their brokenness and sinful lives and heart. And so that's what we see happening here in Sychar. Many more come. Notice the progression. This goes back to John 15. If you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. If you abide in me, you'll bear more fruit. If you abide in me long enough, you will bear much fruit. And what do we see here? Supernaturally, all kind of at one time, much fruit coming forth from Jesus. You know, and, and what really was different here was the proclamation of the gospel. Romans tells us in verses uh, 10, 14, how then will we call on him in whom they have not believed and how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard, and how will they hear without someone preaching? We must proclaim the gospel in grace and love and, and as, as simply and powerfully as we can for people that we have opportunity to engage with. And the result of that will be people coming to faith. And then what I love is the way this passage ends. They said to the, women, the, the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this is indeed, he is the savior of the world. You know, when Jesus came there with his disciples, it was as though he were the savior of the Israelites, the savior of the Jews. But these people, far as I know, the first time in all of scripture, Jesus Christ is called the Savior of the world. And he's called that by Samaritans who came to faith through the supernatural power of God. And that's why this passage is so powerful and sweet. They say, we know, no longer do we need anything but the word of God to grow and know uh, about Jesus. And so this is supernatural missional vision in this, these people. They saw him as a Savior of the world. Praise God for that. You know, as we wrap up, I, I just want to remind you of what's going on here and the impact that Jesus had on this woman and now on these people and everyone in this room. We all believe because of Jesus. We've come to faith. But I want to remind you, there's many, many people out there that have not come to faith, have not believed in Jesus. And so we want to continue to be used by God to draw us to spiritual 
supernatural encounters with people who need Jesus. Pray for that. Go out. Ask questions. Love people. Serve people. But by all means, try to press in and find out where they stand relationally in regard to spiritual things. Are they open at all? Trust uh, that God through His Spirit will encourage you and, and give you supernatural motivation to share your life, share about Jesus, teach the gospel, and then watch and see the supernatural power that will come of all that. We, uh, we met a man walking a dog. I've shared this story with Ken. And my lovely wife, we found out he was a retired physician. My, my lovely wife pressed into him when she heard physician because she's a nurse. And she said, have you ever done a medical mission? Duh. What a great question for a physician. No, I've never done that. But I just lost my wife. I grew up in a church. I watched Joel Osteen. And so he said, why don't you come over to our house and have coffee? So he did. And we talked and got to know him and loved on him and, and just enjoyed the relationship with him. And second or so time, I said, would you be interested at all in reading John's gospel with us? And he said, let me think about that. A couple more times we had coffee. Finally, he went back east to be with his family. Then he came back and, and he said, you know, I thought about that. I think I'm willing to read John's gospel with you. I think I'd like that. So we go over to his house, we open John's gospel, we start reading together, start explaining things to him. And he'd grown up in an Episcopalian church back east in Philadelphia. He was an altar boy or whatever they called him back then, but uh, never came to believing faith, but was open spiritually. That's what we're looking for, right? He was open. I drew out the gospel on a piece of paper and I said, this is how you get from being an unbeliever to become a follower and a believer of Jesus. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. It's in the CTM book. I copied that picture and put it on his table. And I said, ask me any questions you want to about this at any time. And once in a while as we're reading, I would ask him, do you have any questions? We went over one Thursday to be with him, and he said, I got to tell you what happened last Thursday night, the previous Thursday night. He said... I went to bed and I could not sleep. And I was deeply impressed that I had to confess my sins and trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. Boom! New believer. A man older than me. And it has been a joy to continue to walk with him, read the scriptures with him. We're finishing up John's gospel now and he is on fire. Praise God. It's all the Spirit showing up and allowing the Spirit to walk with you deeply into the lives of people, sharing the love of Christ as you're able and as the Spirit opens doors. I want to remind us of this saying that it's in the call to mission. Uh, it, it's a quote from Charles Haddon Spurgeon. It's one of my favorites of all time, of all quotes. He said, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertion, and let not one go unwarned or unprayed for. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful for the uh, work of your spirit, reaching our world, as Jesus said, bringing conviction of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And God, that you and your good pleasure and will would even choose to use us as you use the Samaritan woman to go out in the excitement and joy of this relationship we have with you and to proclaim uh, this powerful, wonderful, amazing gospel. And God, to be used by you to see what happened in and through her life, and to be a little part of that, maybe not in the same ways, but God, to see people love you and come to embrace you and walk with you. God, I, I pray that you would give us many, many supernatural encounters in the next weeks and months and years of our lives. And God, I pray that as we connect with these people 
through your spirit, our supernatural motivation would be to do the will of our Father in heaven and to see many come to faith in Jesus Christ. And Father, to observe with wonder and awe your supernatural powerful work in the lives of people that come to faith. So grateful, God, for you, for the gospel, for King Jesus, that you would even choose to use folks like me and others in this congregation today, all for your glory. We give you thanks and praise all this in Jesus' name.